Um, so this is a, a network field day. So I will um, uh, approach network field day with a wireless focus, but still try to keep it uh, uh, from a network perspective. So first up, um, I want to talk about some things that we're doing around um, uh, packet capture and some some enhancements that we're um, that we're bringing here. So if you have followed MIST at all, um, you know from a wireless perspective, we have a a dynamic packet capture feature where we are uh, anytime that a, a client has a bad um, event, we are capturing that and sending it to the cloud and you can uh, download the packet capture and you know for customers and you know we, we capture millions and millions of, of packet captures every single day across our customers um, hardly any of them get looked at which is a good thing because we have um, it means you don't need to go to the packet capture to uh, understand what's going on but it's there if you need it um, and sometimes it's nice to have um, you know the ability to do a manual packet capture um, which we have had that capability for a long time as well, um, where you come in and you say you want to capture some packets from a, you know, from the APs um, on, you know, either the wireless or wired interface um, on on the AP. But it was a, it was basically this option here: you capture to a PCAP file. Uh, and now what we're you know what we're doing is so when, when you press that capture to file you like, ah, I really i really hope i put in the right filter i'm capturing what i think i'm capturing um, what we're introducing and i'm bringing out is a a streaming packet capture capability where we stream the packet captures from the aps and we're building the framework right where this to be able to have this streaming uh this, this streaming packet capture from devices um and starting with aps so be able to stream the packet capture in real time right into the UI. Um, and then afterwards, if you know, you can download that, that packet capture file um, and open up a Wireshark to do your actual analysis. But you know, within the UI to be able to do you know, basic analysis um, and ensure that you're, you're capturing what you intend to capture. Um, and it's built you know, to kind of scale your, your, cap your capture. So if you're, if you're used to um, doing a, uh, a, a port mirror on individual ports or um, you know, you're, typically your, your packet captures are limited in scale of what you can capture, right? Um, with with MIS packet capture, you can you can capture all APs in a site. So let's say I wanted to look at LLDP, um, and uh, for all the APs in a site, right? And here I just I just did it. These are all the packets coming in. Um, this happens to be um, uh, you know the MIST office, um, and so I can click and I I can see. Um, you know, all of the, uh, all of the LLDP, oh, I didn't take my filter, actually, this, this is actually, uh, here we go. Okay, so here's, here's the LLDP. Um, and, you, you know, so I can just, this is a, this is a missed access point, um, I can see the, the, you know, the capabilities here, just a quick thing. Um, and then uh, be able to download this um, into, uh, into Wireshark and, and do, you know, full analysis. Um, or, you know, from a wireless troubleshooting perspective, let's say I wanted to look at, um, you know, uh, you know, what is, what are, you know, look, let me look at Avi's laptop and see maybe just TCP um, that's coming out of his, his laptop, you know, let's say I wanted to troubleshoot TCP, or I could, you know, pick Avi's laptop, and as he roams around, we'll automatically capture all the associations um, as he's going from AP to AP. Um, so it, it makes just kind of your focused real-time troubleshooting a lot easier um, with, you know, with the real-time streaming packet capture. Um, uh, you know, let's say, and I could, I don't even have to, you know, choose Avi. I, I can choose, you know, all clients, right? Um, and I can choose, I can look at all associations within the network. Um, and then I could filter on, say, equal frames. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, so it just... I'm really excited for this. I think it'll make, uh, like I said, real-time troubleshooting um, a lot easier and a lot, you know, a lot exciting, a lot more exciting rather than just capturing your file, waiting for the file to upload to the cloud, then downloading it again to make sure that you actually, you know, got the right, um, you know, the right packets that you thought that you were going to get. Hey Wes, I have a question on this. This is Jordan Martin. Um, how are you handling like integrity on this? Make sure that you're actually getting all the packets. Because I mean, like, this is one of the challenges around capture historically is. You know, there's only a certain amount of processor on, on a device that's capable of doing it. And then when you talk about transferring it, it's a lot of data mm -hmm. um, on, on a busy network, at least. And you're talking about doing this for multiple devices in a network. So, like, what, what do you do on the back end to make sure that you can trust that this is actually the capture and that we yeah. haven't lost packets along the way? 
No, it's that is a that's a you know it's a fair point and and definitely a concern. Um, so, kind of what we do from a a a default perspective is you know our, our first of all our max packet length um, is truncated. So uh, in most cases, you know you don't necessarily care about data. Um, the full data payload. Now you may, right? If, depending on the troubleshooting that you're doing. And so you can increase this. Um, and then we also, by default, limit the number of packets per AP, right? So we're, we're turning, if you say, hey, I want to capture on all APs, we're, we're going to turn on the capture. And then when we see the relevant, the relevant frames that you want, we're going to send those up to the cloud. So there, there is possibility for a network hit. Um, but the way that we, limit the number of packets right it's it, it is not you know meant to be a, a continuous and we only are streaming data from um you know as it's relevant so you, you know the intention here is you're going to put in you're going to put in filters um and then there's protections to keep you from capturing too much data um now as far as how do you know that you're getting every packet uh that we don't have a way to to guarantee that um, now, the the way that the packet capture works on the the access point is, you know, we're pulling it from the data path, right? We're not um, like when, when we capture on the wireless interface, we're not taking that that interface out of client serving mode. Um, so we're we're pulling it out of out of the data path. Um, so we are, you know, we get we get whatever whatever goes in the data path. So sort of however the you know whatever goes through the data path comes out um, into the packet capture. So it's not like I don't know the implementation will make it so that's not likely that we'll miss packets. Um, but you know, you you can't you you can't guarantee it. Yeah, okay. Appreciate that. You're not alone. That's not a bad answer. Everyone has this challenge, right? It's just yeah. um I know that you know integrity is a big thing. So I appreciate that. Um, you know, ideally you are if if you need to get to the point of manual packet capture, you're looking for something very specific. Um, and you'll use kind of the filtering options. Um, and this will actually be enhanced quite a bit more to put in some pre-can filters. Um, but kind of your you lock down what you're what you're trying to look at and you because you're usually trying to look for a specific thing. Are you guys supporting any immediate like direct export to something like Cloud Shark or, or anything else like that or looking? Uh, at that's it? actually a good point. So um, so today on on the manual packet capture. So this you'll be able to download this um, uh, in into uh, a PCAP into uh, you know into Wireshark. Um, but we already do have an integration uh, with CloudShark uh, uh, from our dynamic uh, PCAP, uh, op, you know, whenever we have a dynamic PCAP. Um, so let me find if... Uh, yeah, that's so, sort of why I was asking. Is, is it Yeah, so so it, it would actually be very easy, right, for us to, to add this button for, um, for, you know, the manual PCAP. And I, I yeah, that's... A good point. It was something that we didn't think, but we should actually do, and it's it's already built, so we should do it. So, um, you know, the next the next big thing in Wi-Fi is Wi-Fi six E, um, and so I want to spend some time talking about how that will impact the wired network, since this is a, a network field day. Um, so we we are entering a new era in Wi-Fi, right? We have this uh, uh, gigabit Wi-Fi, right? Um, well, if you look closely, this is 802.11 AC, and this is published in 2013. So I, I think as, a, as an industry, uh, we have been touting, hey, Wi-Fi, gigabit Wi-Fi, multi-gigabit Wi-Fi. So what does that actually mean from a, you know, a wired networking perspective? You know, what kind of uplinks do you need on, on your APs? Um, and, you know, just more broadly, more recently, you know, we have this, if you look in people's data sheets, the press releases, you know, 5.37 gigabits per second, maximum real world speed, right? The way that the the 802.11 data rate is presented is that is the throughput that you can expect. Um, but if you know Wi-Fi at all, and even if you don't, it, there's a disconnect there, and you'll typically never see that type of throughput um, on you know in in the you know in the real world. Um, and so this is where we kind of enter um, enter Wi-Fi 6E, right? So Wi-Fi 6E is a new um, a, a new frequency band. And mostly, most of the time, what this will mean is you're going to add an additional radio to the access point, um, so more potential for for you know for bandwidth. Um, and there's a lot of a lot of frequency that's being allocated. So in the U.S., we're out getting 1,200 megahertz. 
Um, in other places in the world, they're getting 500 megahertz of spectrum, where if you consider today, most of the total number of available spectrum that we have is about 500 megahertz, maybe a little bit more. So we're, we're more than doubling um, the amount of spectrum that we have. Um, and, and in the US, we're getting considerably more. Um, so from a, a channel width perspective, right? So in Wi-Fi, you can have different channel widths um, and faster speeds if you use wider channel widths, but then you don't have as many channels. Um, this, the point of the slide is to show in, in six gig, the green uh, color here, we have 14 80 megahertz channels, which is more than the number of 40 megahertz channels than we have in five gig today. And then for some other reasons with um, you know, how the scanning is gonna happen, 80, so likely you're gonna see 80 megahertz channels as the default channel width. Now, why is this relevant? Well, um, if we come back to our conversation around uh, how much, you know, what do you actually need M gig for your AP uplink? Um, so let's start with some facts, right? So today across the MIST universe, most MIST APs um, based on analysis that we did, utilize less than 100 megabits per second aggregate, right, through, from their Ethernet interface, um, and you know, depend, and that'll be kind of channel width dependent as well. Um, the peaks, though, will you know, you can burst, you know, typically 200 to 500 megabits per second, depending on the channel bandwidth that you use. Um, so the general rule of thumb is you need 100 megahertz of total band of total frequency, you know, across all your radios to exceed a gigabit per second. Um, and this is typically gonna be for a burst, right? You're, you're not, you're not gonna see sustained traffic. Um, and so if I put up this, this chart around, hey, this is what we think you know, is gonna happen with real world throughput. Um, so today we're in this dual band mode, right? With, with 20 megahertz on 2.4 and 20 megahertz on five gig, or maybe even 20 megahertz on 2.4 and 40 megahertz on five gig. Or we could do like dual five gig and have 40 megahertz channels on both radios. In all these combinations, you're not likely to exceed a gig in real world. Now in labs, you can always do it, but in real world, you're still under a gig of throughput. Con so you're kind of below that, hey, do I really need M gig? With Wi-Fi 6E, adding a third radio to the access point and then defaulting to 80 megahertz in six gig, it still doesn't mean that you're going to exceed a gig, um, but you you now have sort of the best the best chance to exceed a gig, right? I, I think there will be circumstances where you burst above a gig, um, and so for customers who who care, you know, want to protect themselves for future and and will care about these bursts, in gig actually, you know, absolutely makes sense. Um, it's not a requirement, um, I don't think, but it it it'll you know it'll help and and kind of the you know, I've, I've always been a skeptic of this messaging around you need MGIG, um, but sort of how I'm approaching it now is it's the best chance. You have the best chance of exceeding gig than we've ever had, right? We've been touting gigabit Wi-Fi since 2013, but now finally in 2020, you know, 2022 with Wi-Fi 6E, um, you now have the best chance of exceeding a gig and actually utilizing that MGIG link. Now, how about power? Um, that's the other piece, right? What is the, what is the POE impact? Um, so most of your higher end access points or Wi-Fi 6E access points um, will require 802.3 BT for full Wi-Fi functionality. Now the, um, the lower end APs like the two by two APs um, and even, even the four by four APs, but with reduced functionality will work on AT. Um, so he, this is actually missed, this is the missed AP45, our, our flagship four by four. So on full Wi-Fi functionality, we need 31 watts. Um, we do work just fine um, on on AT and, and if we can only get 30 watts, uh, but and we'll we'll reduce functionality on, on some of the radios. Um, but just kind of know that BT will be helpful. Um, for Wi-Fi 6E deployments, and as you're, you know, if if you're supporting Wi-Fi 6E deployments in your um, in your organization, um, but likely most manufacturers will also come out with an AT operating mode as well. Um, and then speaking of BT, uh, just remember to turn it on. <laughs> so on Juniper, depending on the switch, it may or may not be on by default. Um, you can check if you're in BT mode by doing the Show PoE controller. 
Um, and then on Cisco, you also need to turn on um, BT mode. And I think for most other vendors you do um, as well. So this, this is actually, um, we had a customer just the other day who um, was turn, wanted to use the, the POE out functionality on our existing APs. Um, and to do that with the AP43, you need BT power. And they had a Cisco switch and they're wondering, hey, why isn't this uh, working well? Because the, the Cisco switch wasn't in uh, in BT mode. So just remember to turn on if, if you intend to use it.